Hart is in for Fourier today. Joining us now on the Harbor One hotline of Nesson and WEEI, our guy Andrew Razor Raycroft. Razor, good morning, friend. How are you? Good morning, gang. I'm wonderful. Uh, yeah, Fourier is uh, sunning himself somewhere. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? Yeah. I figured he had like the norovirus or, you know, he was out partying. And- no, no. no. He's nude. No, that's... He's uh, nude sunbathing somewhere. Yeah, that, the norovirus is what Greg Hill is using to maybe not go to Florida <laughs> this weekend. But that's another story yeah. for another time. We love our guy Greg, and hopefully he's feeling okay. But uh, yes. uh, So uh, the rare overtime win last night, and it happened lickety-split. I mean, uh, lose the face-off down the other end, uh, two-on-one back the other way. DeBrusque makes it uh, look easy psychologically big to go on the road and get an overtime win or has all this overtime stuff razor been overblown? No, I think it feels good. I think it's a, a, it's certainly a positive. You don't want to look, you know, overtimes. There's been too many losses in overtime to to feel good about it. So it's, it's nice for Linus Allmark to get an overtime win. It's nice for the team to get one. Psychologically, it doesn't make a difference, I don't think, for this group one way or the other. They know they're not playing three on three or shootouts in playoffs, but um, it was just, it just, it's just a feel good for the night, feel good for today, and, and put them, you know, a little bit of a different momentum, a little bit of a different mindset going into tomorrow night's game. But um, it, it's, uh, it was, it was good to grind that out last night. Both teams were, were very average, and, and it's nice to just win on the road, and especially in Montreal. Razor, I think we can all agree the Bruins have overachieved to some degree this year to to narratives and perceptions coming into the season. I'm wondering if you have a few reasons for that and guys maybe that have overachieved on an individual level. A name I would throw out there for me as sort of a layman hockey outsider is Geeky. I feel like Geeky has been a better player than I expected him to be, especially of late. He's been on a little scoring streak of late. So maybe some names that you think are part of why the Bruins might be higher in the standings than people expected them to be. Yeah. So, well, you know, the just the, the narrative, of course, was the, the last season how great they were. But all you know, Bergeron and Krejci, right? right. So you're you're saying who's going to fill in for these guys? How? I think it's certainly in hindsight um, that that people maybe not watching all the time didn't really recognize how great team structure this team has when you have a team. With Pasternak, with McAvoy, with Marshawn, with the two goaltenders they have, with Hampus Lindholm, you're not losing. Like there's a there, there's teams, there's 25 teams that would love to have that core for the next seven years, like the Bruins have. And and if you do have that kind of a core, you're never going to the bottom. You're never out of the playoff mix. You're you're always there. So it starts with those guys, and I think that got severely overlooked. And then you go to that second tier, Morgan Geeky's perfect example. The Bruins, the organization, Don Sweeney, his team have done such a good job of recognizing players from other teams that they know can help their team and fit in the structure and fit with the culture and be the character kind of players. Morgan Geeky, Danton Heinen, James Van Riemsdyk, those those three guys that that come in this season and, and fit in seamlessly on the cheap when they're up against the cap and how are they going to put a team together? Uh, they they've recognized and done a wonderful job getting those guys in here. Our buddy Andrew Raycroft talking Bruins with Gresh and Fourier. Andy Hart in for Foyer today. And uh, Razor, you mentioned Danton Heinen. I know he scored the first goal last night. Is this guy played his way into an extension here? Well, he's he's worked his way into some kind of a multi-year deal for next season, and so so if the Bruins don't give it to him, he's going to get it somewhere else. I think we've seen that he is very comfortable here in Boston. This is his second go around. He he left and uh, had a decent season in Pittsburgh last season. Has let's not say breakout because he's been an NHLer for a while now, but he's looking at 30 to 35 points this season. He's now playing in a top six role, like a perfect complement to Zaka and Pasternak right now. So, so certainly he's going to have a multi-year NHL deal. I think a fit works for him here in Boston, but that'll be something that gets done in the spring, summer when, when the dust really settles and, and you see how much cap dollars you have and you see what kind of direction you want to go in after what you hope is a long playoff run.
Pretty sure you qualify as an expert witness, a Mona Lisa Vito, in terms of goaltenders and dynamics in that room. Um, I think some of us were wondering or even hoping, speculating that Ulmark would be dealt. He wasn't. He's back. Uh, Swayman has become your number one goaltender. He's been a little feisty of late from what I've seen. What do you think the dynamic is in that room in that situation heading into the postseason? I think it's fine. I think it's – I don't think any of that has changed in the room. I think, um, you know, they, they compete very hard against each other. They feel very comfortable competing with each other. They, they are – genuinely happy when the other guy plays well and it also fires them to to be ready to go on that rotation so so i don't see how that's changed i don't um i think both guys want the net i think both guys want game one i don't think that's been determined yet and it'll be it'll be interesting how that plays out over the net but they've got basically eight seven starts each to to prove and, and to work their game and be ready to go and I think they both realize that they have to win a playoff series. This will be the third year now with the two of them together as partners. And, you know, right now they have two game seven losses on their card. So they, they, I think they know that they have to go on a run. And I think they know that both of them will be instrumental in that happening. Not knowing who the game one starter is, if that's accurate, if that's where they are as an organization um, coming down the home stretch here, it, is that, a concern? I mean, we certainly look back at last year and would say maybe the goalie situation got mismanaged and that was part of the, the reason you um, had one of the great upsets in hockey history. Is is that a problem? Does somebody need to know? Does that affect things? I know in baseball, like, ah, oh, we need to know who our ace is. We need to know who our closer is. Guys need to know their roles. Do you, you? So you don't believe that's a problem, that they may not know who their game one goalie is right now? No, I don't. I, I, I don't think that at all. I think there's teams that have that problem – because they don't have good goaltending. Like they're the Toronto Maple Leafs, let's say. They they don't know. They have three guys they don't know who their game one is. And and that's probably against the Boston Bruins. They don't know who their starter is. Um the Philadelphia Flyers, they don't know who their starter is. Like but that's because they don't have good goaltending. Um the Bruins it's the act the exact opposite. So no, these guys, the players, the coaches, the goaltenders themselves aren't aren't laser focused on who's game one because they have good goaltending and, and someone's going to go in and listen, you have to do it right. Like that's the other, you, you do have to close it out, but that's, that's, that happens only on April 20th to April 30th. You can't do anything about that right now. All you know is you have good goaltending and goaltending that is more than capable of winning game one, game two, and, and getting four of those in the first round. Johnny Beecher has been great on the dot this year. A, how important is that to this team? And B, how have you seen Beecher get better this season? Well, he came back after being in the minors for the last two months last night. He looked good. He won eight of 11 draws last night. So uh, a good re-promotion for him. Uh, He's got to stay consistent in that. He's got to be physical. He's got to be hard to play against. And, um, of course, the face-off, will be a reason for him to be here if he can continue to pace at over 55% that he has. Um, but you have to do more. You can't just go out there and play and be a face-off guy. You have, to, you have to kill penalties and get out of the defensive zone, and he has to continue to prove that as a young person that, that he can do that and handle that job. So the face-off's giving him a bit of an in right now in, in that, We've seen the struggles on some of the draws late in periods, late in games, and, and he might be the cure to that. But you have to play a, a hard five-on-five five game, and I thought he did so last night in his first game back. It's all about you know repeating and, and doing it against the higher-end teams in the Eastern Conference, not just the Montreal Canadiens. So the Bruins own the Maple Leafs, and my world, football world, division potential playoff game where you say, oh, you know, it's hard to beat a a division opponent three times when you go into some wild card matchup, uh, which I've never understood. I always want to be the team that's won more often because I feel like that means I'm the better team. But do the Bruins just own the Maple Leafs? Is there any trepidation like that the dominance could run out or that the pendulum is due to to shift if that's a, a playoff matchup? No, I think the matchup's really good. I, I don't like. I think, and I, I agree with you in the in the football analogy. I'd rather be the team that's two and zero rather right. than zero and two going in. Like it's just like it's the same as the, oh, the worst lead in hockey is a two goal lead. No, the worst lead is a one goal lead. Like let's let's call it. You know, right. let's let's be real about this. Um, 
So, so I, I think because the Bruins have won games because they match up very well. It hasn't been the Bruins have been winning games because they've gotten lucky and because their goalies have stood on their heads or because Toronto's goal. Like, it's because the Bruins' structure defensively allows them to gain offense against, or against Toronto in that Toronto can be undisciplined. They can push too hard offensively. Things open up and then and then the power play has been good as well uh, on the Leafs' PK. So the matchup's very good. It's not like the Bruins are going to sweep the Leafs four straight, but I think over a seven-game series, they feel comfortable that their players and their style matches up well against the Toronto Maple Leaf team. Andrew Razor Raycroft with Gresham Fourier. We've got Andy Hart in for Foyer today. Razor went. Questions are so much better today, by the way, without Fourier. Oh, yeah. Right? Like we're, yeah, we're yeah. cruising along here. <laughs> we're staying on point. Fourier is not distracting us. Yeah, there's no uh, odd questions about uh, yeah. jock straps or uh, sharpening <laughs> skates or, you know. Well, uh, I do man. have one. The Maple Leafs goalie situation you brought up. I watched that game a few weeks ago, and I say, is there a better name to have for a goalie than Wall? Like, that's no, the that's perfect good, goalie name. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, old Stony, right? <laughs> exactly. Stonewall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the whole thing. Uh, a little bit uh, later, we're going to do the uh, names of the year in uh, college basketball. Uh oh, we may get in FCC <laughs> trouble. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's very good stuff. Razor, uh, the Bruins are a point behind Florida for the lead in the Atlantic Division. Florida has a game in hand. Uh, I will steal the Fourier segment that he created. Big deal or no big deal, if the Bruins do or do not win the division, how do you view that? Is it important for the Bees to be that number one team and win the Atlantic? I don't believe it is, no. I don't, and, and I know that they're not setting their sights on it. I'm very interested in the two games they have against Florida still. Those will be very interesting games. Should be a lot of intensity. You're gonna. We've seen it, right? We saw it last year. Like it's just so. It's so easy to go with these cliches that are actually real in hockey. They they might not pertain to other sports like basketball, especially where essentially the first round, the best players, the best teams, the best team. In hockey, it's not. It just isn't. You have to get in, and any team's going to be difficult right now. Whether it's the New York Islanders or the Tampa Bay Lightning. Those two teams are going to be very formidable in a first round for whoever the one seed is and whoever the two seed is. So I think we just talked about the matchup Toronto presents. Either way, you have home ice in the first round. I think that's beneficial. Um, it would be it would be nice for them to win the division just because that was so unexpected to start this season. But if they end up, you know, coming up a couple points short on Florida, they're not going to be too. Uh, they're not going to think about that for more than. 10 seconds at the end of the season and, and they'll be ready for whoever they have to play. Speaking of thinking things more than 10 seconds, does the fact that the Panthers went on a run in the postseason last year to the cup finals and then this year have what the best points in hockey right now, um, does that take any of the sting out of that falling on your face in the first round last year? Or is that just me trying to put lipstick on a pig? No, I think it should to a point. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not abstaining them in any way, but I, I think I, I, well, hopefully everyone can recognize that this team really wasn't an eight seed last year. Uh, they had so many injury, like it wasn't a typical eight seed. It wasn't uh, a team. This is, they were the, pre, and by the, and also right, Andy, they were the president cup tr or president trophy winners the year before. Right. So essentially they won the President's Trophy two years ago. Last year, they, they went on a run at the end of the season again and went to the Stanley Cup Finals, and then this year they could win the President's Trophy again. So uh, in that line of questioning, you can uh, you could talk it away. The issue for me is the Bruins were up 3-1 to one in the series. That That's the issue for me. They had a power play in Game 5. They were in overtime in Game 5. They had a two-goal. They had a lead in the last 10 minutes in both Game 6 and Game 7. That's where that's where it's hard to to be you know to talk it away. So so Florida wins the series. I think that could have happened no matter how many points the Bruins had last season. But being up three to one and having leads in in five, six, and seven that's that's kind of the kicker. Uh, Razor, as you is there anything else in the league that is piquing your interest right now? Whether it is a divisional race. 
you know, uh, I don't know, a battle for playing time somewhere, maybe with a young kid that could make a big difference. Like, I know we focus so much on on the Bruins, and it's been such a great season, and I have a point behind Florida, okay, fine, but is there anything else in the Eastern Conference that you're keeping your eye on here over the next month, let's say? It's especially the, the playoff race at the bottom. It got tight. It, it looked three weeks ago that Detroit was going to get in with Tampa Bay. Detroit's reeled off seven losses. Islanders have jumped Detroit. Washington's hanging around still. Philadelphia's in the three spot that's kind of fighting that they could drop all the way out of the three spot in the Metro, all the way out of the playoffs. So it, it, the, the playoff race is going to be really exciting here over the last 15 games for these teams. And that it will pertain, it could pertain to to the Bruins and who they're playing. Because I, I think that it's, we – Florida's gone on a long run. They're going to have tough games. They lost last night to Carolina for nothing. That hasn't happened to them too often recently. So I think the Bruins are going to be in a battle with Florida all the way to the end, and that's going to make the, the playoffs at the bottom interesting as well. So that, that's kind of where I'm looking out in the West. The Central Division is Colorado, Dallas, Winnipeg. Three of the best teams over there are all fighting that like that division, you want to be first place because otherwise you're playing one of the best teams in the league in the first round. That one, two, the two, three in the central is going to be ridiculously hard to play. So that's like a race where you want to be number one out there. So that, those are my two things I'm really kind of keying in on outside of the Bruins here for the last four weeks of the year. All right, so uh, channeling my inner Fourier and asking the most notable hockey guy I know a random question about equipment, uh, I've watched a couple high school hockey games this year. Good Lord. Where these freaking skates that I know parents pay through the nose to get, the the, the blade just, like, pops off mid-game, and you got this kid, like, squirming across the ice to try to get to the bench while there's, like, this piece of metal just flying. Like, what the hell's going on with these skates? <laughs> well... The, the skates now, you can pull, you pop the blade out, you can change them in and out. Now, the issue is with the call, the high school kids and, and even the minor hockey kids, and, and hopefully no one is listening takes offense to this, but the parents have gone off the rails a little bit. As, as you, know, you can't imagine, right, that, that minor sport parents are crazy <laughs> and have gone a little too crazy. Like, no, oh, I, I know that's hard to believe. But they're acting like they're kids in the NHL, and the high school kids are acting like they're in the NHL, and they're changing their blades in and out uh, at period to period, or they don't like the way one sharp when they have like three extra sets of blades, and they're messing it up, and they're not putting them in properly, and they're flying out, and um, you know, again, keep it simple. You're not in the NHL. <laughs> you don't have NHL type equipment managers fixing it. So you see the guys moving them in and out. They have the best gear. And it's not the same kind of gear that you guys have. So just sharpen your skates every game and go out and play hockey. There you go. Great uh, advice from our guy, Andrew Raycroft, with us on the Harbor One Hotline. Razor, thanks a bunch. Hopefully you enjoyed it much better than the last couple of... That's what I figured. (laughs) That is what I figured, friend. Have a uh, great weekend. See ya. Yeah, you guys too. Thanks for having me. There goes Razor. Oh, man. Before he's going to be so upset.